Welcome, my subnautic super friends, to the mysterious seas of the mortal realms, because today we are talking all about the Eidneth Deepkin, and a story that pits them against the vampires of New Lamia, that's Neferata's own personal cohort of blood knights, on the shores of Shai-ish. And we're going to be talking not only about the story itself, but the implications that it has, because there are some really cool new lore tidbits regarding a specific subfaction of the Deepkin in this story. Today's story is called Blood Coast. Commanded by the cold hearted Achelian queen, Telria Mistart, the Morphon Enclave raids the coastline of Neferatia, striking at the coastal blood farms in which the soul blight of that region store docile, mind shrouded human thralls destined for the feeding tables of New Lamia. Mortark Neferata sends forth her legion of blood to rout the invaders, granting command to the vampire lord Radvak, one of her current favorite courtiers. When next Mistheart's Morphon rise from the waves, Radvok and his blood knights await them. Along the gloomy shores of the Neferatian coast, a terrible battle is waged, with the crimson-clad vampire cavaliers crushing into charging formations of Morsar guard. Queen Mistheart eventually strikes Radvok from his steed, and her Isharun bind him in fetters of ice. As he is dragged beneath the waves, the vampire realizes to his horror that the Morphon were seeking a much grander prize than mere mortal blood chattel. What an epic story. So for those of you who are fairly new to the game, the Deepkin are a faction that require soul raids to survive. Essentially, um, most of their faction is broken in some way from a defect in their creation where they need to go out and harvest souls from other creatures and people to be able to put inside of their bodies. So they'll raid a town, kill everyone, take their souls, bring them back to their underwater layers, and put those souls inside of their young, thereby propagating their civilization. And that seems pretty simple enough. I mean, there's a lot of cool dark threads there. They still have this macabre nobility to them. But there's more going on with this story specifically because of the subfaction, and that is the Morphon. This is a enclave of the Eidneth Deepkin that has made their home in Shai-ish, the realm of death. As such, they have become used to a different kind of set of conditions underwater, where the waters are like black and oily and there's almost no sight whatsoever. Death magic teams everywhere, there are undead leviathans underwater that they have to contend with, and of course, the Eye of Nagash himself is constantly looking for what he calls soul thieves. Because in his mind, these souls rightfully belong to him, but numerous factions, of which the Morphon are one, keep taking them. Now, what's different about this entry in the Morphon than the last one is I definitely got the sense of necromancy being a theme amongst them. In the last book, or I should say their first book, it really just felt like, oh yeah, these are the ones who focus on line infantry, and so Morphon have ways of bringing back more... Namardi thralls and reavers to their units than anybody else, and that's really what it was for the longest time. In this book, uh, when they brought up the Morphon, I, I skipped ahead and went to their entry, their little enclave section, and there's a lot to do about death magic. That sort of, instead of just being fairly good at taking souls from the sky and then throwing them back into bodies, no, now we're kind of are they integrating necromancy somehow? Because the rate at which they are able to refresh their troops, meaning put souls into bodies, bring them back up into battle, that kind of thing, is astounding, but also very unnatural. Like, other enclaves look at this and are like, that seems like you're too good at it. And when you're too good at something, it tends to raise questions in the Warhammer universe. Other notable things about them is they attack the living just as much as they do the dead. So Shayish, of course, is a place littered with all different types of civilizations. You'll have entire, like, skeleton cities where they just do their own thing. Maybe they work, they mine, they do whatever they need to do to survive, but everyone there is dead. They just kind of keep on going. Conversely, on the other end of the spectrum, you have entire cities of just normal people just living their day-to-day -day lives. Some societies, like in uh, Nagash Undying King, fuse both of these things, where you have living people and they get to interact with their ancestors daily, which increases the overall wisdom and, and ability to survive in a hostile land because you just pass on information so much more acutely. So there's all kinds of civilizations happening here. The target was the human chattel 
pits, essentially, that Neferata feeds from. She'll have entire towns that are bewitched by her and her magics. They don't think anything weird is happening, or if they do, there's some minor explanation and we don't dwell on it too much. But in fact, they are essentially a farm, a blood farm. I don't know how else to say it. They grow humans in these towns, take them away, and then have them on the dinner table. And so, from the Defender's perspective, Neferata's like, oh yeah, they're, they're gonna raid my farm? No, 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 we're not gonna have that. And so she sends out her Blood Knights. But it's never confirmed why they attack the living just as much as they do the dead. You would think the dead would have so much less to offer them. There's no souls there. And so, like you would normally do, right, if you know that your enemy is trying to get something that you control, you put yourself between the enemy and the thing that they want. The mistake here, though, is assuming that they wanted nothing but the humans. Now, like I said, just said, we don't know exactly what they're doing. We know there's a lot of hints to using death magic and vampires, of which every single Blood Knight is one, would make a fascinating study in necromancy as they are, of course, able to raise the dead. And this revelation, with also the lack of clear information, is exactly what passed through our hero Rodvok's mind as he was being dragged underwater. Why do they need vampires? Like, I, I love the idea of Morphon having a completely different, you know, set of things that they're hunting for other than just souls. Because in that sense, they could do these tiny raids to draw out a response. In this case, Neferata sent a whole bunch of Blood Knights. So they get the big prize, which is the humans and all the vampires who were sent to defend them. Now, I know this is a bit shorter one because it's more of a fascinating concept than a, a concrete story. There's not a blow by blow of the battle or anything like that so why is this cool and why did i want to touch on it well first of all this is the first story the short story from the timeline that i've touched on in the deepkin book there are a lot of awesome tales here and whenever faction lines blur in this case uh, a faction of order not in the deepkin kind of toying with the magics of another meaning death things get really interesting so for example marathi who needed the realm stone of chaos to become a god or one of the early rumgate war stories where a stormcast lost an arm and it was regrown with alario's magic but now it has this weird giran glow to it like you can actually see in his soul form there's something weird about his arm like it's just a different kind of magic grafted on all these things whenever lines get blurred between factions it creates a lot of interest now, what, this is all speculation at this point, what would the Deepkin want with necromancy magic? Well, first of all, the whole setting that they are in, Shyish, uh, is saturated with it. So they can learn some secrets from it or how to use it. It is only to their benefit. Other enclaves may not understand, they may get shunned for it, but them, with their particular location, will only do better by understanding it, first of all. So like, even if it's not related to how they raise you know, their souls back or whatever, it's still just a good thing to study and understand. Vampires make fantastic subjects for this study. And that's like on the more tame end, right? They're just taking wielders of death magic to like study it and understand it. On the far end of the spectrum is that they are trying to reverse engineer and weaponize it. And that is where things get weird. Because imagine like... You know, instead of Deepkin, Deathkin. That'd be an amazing idea, right? Because at that point, what if, hypothetically, like I'm thinking of like a sales pitch that like a researcher could pitch to the Enclave to like get them to help him get vampires. But imagine if you could have a Deepkin army roll up. You have the soul renders rip souls from bodies, and then you reanimate those same bodies to fight. Now you're making money on top of money because the warriors that you send forward to die are soulless and they're not deepkin, which means they're immediately lesser than. The zombies go attack the next town where the souls are reaped, the bodies are raised, and you just keep on going. Is Games Workshop ever going to do that rules-wise? I highly doubt it. It's a cool idea, though, and you can absolutely understand why some people in the Morphon Enclave would be like, we need to research this because it, it, we're leaving money on the table. Now, we do get the sense that they are using death magics, or at least experimenting or researching it by the fact that they can resurrect their own people on the ground. It's not necromancy. It's just a mastery of how to use, collect, and implement souls, which essentially is what a lot of death magic is. It's not entirely, but it's a lot of it. So even if that was all they did, that could easily make them the most numerous and large of all the enclaves. Because the corruption of their species, what prevents them from being born with souls, 
is really what holds them back in my opinion. So what happens when you begin to curb that kind of species-wide issue? It would have an incredible effect on them. And it also puts them in a position where other enclaves can look at this and be like, you know, we kind of want the same thing, but we don't want it like this. And they can be shunned and kicked out. I mean, we see it with the Fire Slayers. They don't like anyone who is either too honorable to accept money for their contracts, and they shun them. But they also don't like people who do everything for coin and to the basically the, the detriment of Grimnir's values. This could easily be a same situation where, yeah, we want that same thing, but you guys took it down a path that the other enclaves would never, never be willing to pay the price for. And those things are interesting to me because sub-factions really should be a window into seeing how fantastically different people from the same faction can be. Just as nations and religions can form vastly different people in our real world. It's of course just taken to the next level. So friends, I would love to hear your thoughts on this story. Again, it is on page 21 of the new Deepkin book. It's called Blood Coast, and if nothing else, it gets Neferata into a fight with the Deepkin, which is a matchup that I am here to see. Leave your thoughts on the story and the implications of death magic with Deepkin in the comments down below. I will respond to you there. Thank you all so much for watching and listening, and I'll catch you next time. Happy Wargaming.